So we are going to talk about the manual airway maneuvers first. And so remember we have a couple of different ones of those. We have the head tilt chin lift, right? And just as its name implies, I'm gonna push back on his forehead and lift up on his chin. But because of this uh, difference that it's putting here in his neck, I do not wanna use that on somebody who has a spinal or a suspected spinal injury, um, just so we don't want this to happen back here, okay? So head tilt chin lift, that's gonna help reposition and open up the airway. Now, if he had a spinal injury, known or suspected, I'm gonna use uh, the jaw thrust, okay? And so for the jaw thrust, what I wanna do is come in and I'm gonna put my two fingers behind the corner of his jaw, and I'm gonna use my thumbs and kinda push down on the cheekbones, and I'm gonna lift up. Now, you wanna be really careful that you're not pushing down, okay? Because that's not gonna do anything. What I wanna do is open this up. So I'm gonna push down on the cheeks, and I'm lifting up with these two fingers. It's difficult for you and it's painful for them. So likely they're gonna be unresponsive, okay? And I need to hold this. So unlike the head tilt chin lift where I could let go this, I need to hold for as long as I, I need to, okay? So that's for the jaw thrust. Now, uh, for the other two, I'm gonna show you really quickly. We're gonna use the cross finger technique to open the mouth for these uh, other adjuncts. But just to show you right now, I'm gonna put my middle finger up on the top row of teeth. I'm gonna put my thumb down on the bottom and I'm going to push away from each other, okay? And that's the cross finger technique. So my fingers are literally making a cross or an X and I'm pushing away from each other, okay? And so when I do that, I'm gonna put in that OPA in just a second, but I wanna show you one more, which we'll talk about tomorrow with advanced airways, but that's gonna be the bass maneuver, or you also see that listed in platinum as the tongue jaw lift. So I'm gonna physically put my thumb down on his tongue all the way almost to the base, all right? So you really want him, he should be unresponsive with no gag reflex anyway if you're doing this blind insertion airway, but so hopefully no potential for him to bite you, but you're gonna put your thumb down and you're going to literally lift up like this on his jaw, all right? So we'll do that tomorrow with some of the blind insertion devices, but you will see that on the manual airway maneuvers checkoff sheet in platinum. So I wanted to address it today, okay? All right, so we're gonna look at some oxygen administration devices. So the first on our list is going to be the nasal cannula. Now to set that up, I need my oxygen tank set up. And so I need to know that this is medical oxygen and I can identify that a couple of ways. Number one is that the tank is green. That usually identifies medical oxygen. It might also have a label on it that tells you it's medical oxygen, but some of them may not. They may have worn away, okay? And then it's gonna fit the pin index system. Remember we talked about that earlier, all right? So this regulator should only fit to an oxygen tank. It's not gonna fit to a tank of any other type of compressed gas. So if I took this and it was brand new, now this one's already been opened, but if I had a brand new tank, it's likely sealed with some type of plastic around here that I would have to break off and expose these pins, okay, the pinholes. And so also attached in that, probably right here on this side, would be a small, usually green ring. And we'll call that the O-ring, okay? We'll need that in just a second. But when I first open up this tank, the first thing that I wanna do is take this oxygen wrench and I'm gonna crack the tank. Now some tanks have just knobs that you can turn the top and it will crack on its own. This one needs a wrench, okay? So I'm gonna get the wrench. I'm gonna crack the tank and I'm gonna blow out any dust and particles and things that may have settled into the bottom of the tank. All right, so I'm gonna crack that and just let some dust out. Now I'm ready to put my uh, regulator on, so I'm gonna take this. Now, remember I mentioned the O-ring, all right? If you have the O-ring, then you're gonna put it right here on this big portion of the pin up against the big hole on this side, and it's gonna fit right in between that. That's if you have a leak. Not every single one needs it. Sometimes you can put the regulator on without the O-ring. They obviously get lost. That's why I don't have one right now. But if you are notice that when you put this on, you've got a leak, you might need an O-ring, okay? So I'm gonna put this on. I'm lining up the holes. Now I'm gonna twist this and get it tight in there, all right? And I can use the wrench to kind of tighten this down if I need to, but be careful because this wrench is plastic, all right? And now I'm gonna crack the tank again. Now, ideally, I don't want it to leak, all right? It might, this one didn't, all right? So I cracked the tank back open now. Now what I see on my regulator is how full is the tank, right? And so a full brand new tank should be at about 2,000 PSI, okay? This one right now is about 1,200. 
So this has 1200 PSI, I need to change it out if it's at 500, I need to not use it if it's less than 200 for sure, okay? So if this had started leaking when I cracked it back open, what I would do is just go in and take, t turn it back off, tighten this down, or put an O-ring in if it needed it, that type of thing. Okay, but for right now, this is good to go. Now on this side is how I'm gonna control how much oxygen I'm delivering. So right now it's at zero. I'm gonna turn that up to however much I need to, depending on what device I'm giving oxygen through, which we'll see here in just a second, okay? This piece right here is where I'm gonna attach my oxygen tubing. So for um, the first thing, which is gonna be the nasal cannula, I'm gonna set that between one and six liters per minute of oxygen. Normally people go between two and four. So I'm gonna hook this up right here. I'm gonna turn this up to two liters. And now I'm gonna prepare to put this on my patient. And I'm gonna tell him, sir, I'm gonna put this oxygen in your nose. It's gonna tickle just a little bit, okay? When I get ready to put this in, these are pretty straight forward prongs. They don't have a lot of bend in them, but some of them do. Um, I think this one that I have, which is gonna be for, um, to talk about end title, that's a little bit more bent. If they are bent, you want them to go like kind of snake fangs like this down into the nose, not up, okay? But these are straight. So I'm gonna put this directly in his nose from the front, and I'm gonna wrap this around his ears. Now this mannequin doesn't have great ears for this, but when I put this on my patient, I'm gonna do that and then tighten this up underneath his chin there, okay? And now I'm gonna just monitor my patient, monitor my oxygen tank, make sure the patient's improving, do they need to do anything different, all that good stuff, okay? Now, if I was gonna move him over to a non-rebreather, I would take this off, I get out my non-rebreather, this is actually a pediatric size, but it will work for what we need it for. I'm gonna hook this piece up. Now the non-rebreather I need to set at between 10 and 15 liters of oxygen. But remember, I don't want the bag to deflate more than one third when they're taking a breath, okay? So when I first hook this up, I'm just gonna put it on 10. And we can see that the reservoir bag is beginning to fill up, all right? I don't have to do anything to it. It'll fill up pretty quickly. But if you want it to fill up a little bit faster, you can clamp this off. What you don't want to do is put your gloved hand inside of it because you've got germs on your hands, you're putting it in the mask, don't want any of that. But if you push down on this, just kind of fold the mask in half, that will help this fill up just a little bit faster. All right, it's not going to pop. Once it's full, it's full. No more air is going to go in there, okay? And now I'm ready to put this on the patient's face. So I'm going to take this mask, I'm going to put it right around his head, put the mask over his mouth and nose. It has this metal clamp on it that I can just bend down so he doesn't have a lot of oxygen flowing back out into his eyes. He's getting what he needs. And then again, I'm monitoring this to see when he breathes in, is this bag deflating more than a third? And if it is, I might need to bump up to 12 or 15 liters, okay? All right, so that's the non rebreather now, the next one that I'm going to show you has a platinum sheet for it, but this is not something you will commonly uh, see used out in the field, at least not around here, all right? Maybe with critical care or long transports and stuff like that, but this is called a Venturi mask, okay? And so the concept is really the same. It just has a lot of pieces, and it delivers a specifically concentrated amount of oxygen to what you want it to be, all right? So this is just like a regular nebulizer mask that I would hook up to my nebulizer, but usually it comes with everything you need packaged here. This tube goes on here. It has all of these colored pieces, has some other ones as well. And so it tells you right on the bottom, like this one says two liters, that's delivering 24% oxygen. This one says if I wanted to deliver eight liters, that's gonna be 35% oxygen, okay? And so let's say that's what I wanted to do is 35% oxygen. I would put this piece on. I would take oxygen tubing, which has a connector piece at both ends, all right? I'm gonna hook one end up to the bottom of the color piece, one end up to the oxygen tank. Now I chose eight liters, so that's what I'm gonna set this to is eight liters. That blew off, so that means it's not really tolerating it being up that high, but anyways, um, I would put this on the patient's face. Again, something that we gotta do for a national registry, but not something that you see a whole lot in the field. Okay, that one's pretty simple. Everybody good so far? All right. 
So while we're on this, we have already talked about end title extensively, but I'm going to go ahead and show you this side stream end title while we're talking about nasal cannulas. This one comes packaged just like a regular nasal cannula, except for in addition to having the oxygen tubing that I can hook up here, it also has the piece that will hook up to my cardiac monitor, which is going to help to measure the end title. Okay. And so I'm gonna put this on just like I would a regular nasal cannula. But this patient needs to be breathing through their nose so that I can adequately measure their exhalation, all right? So I'm gonna put this on there. I'm gonna tighten it up just like I would, set my settings at normal. But this is gonna allow me to monitor their end title, both the capnography waveform and the capnometry number, okay? So that's for side stream. Now, We'll just talk about the OPA and NPA. So these are our basic airway adjuncts, right? We have two options for that. And when we have these in place, like in a cardiac arrest, we still stay at that 30 to two ratio, okay? It's not until we use an advanced airway or one of the blind insertion devices from tomorrow that we are going to switch to that continuous compressions and one breath every five to six seconds, all right? With these in place, we're still doing 30 to two for CPR, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, I've measured for my patient, he does not have a gag reflex, right, he can't have a gag reflex for this to go in. So I've measured now from the corner of his mouth down to his earlobe to make sure that this is a good fit for him, all right, again, doesn't have a gag reflex. I'm going to come in and I'm going to open his mouth using the cross finger technique. And now I'm gonna put this OPA starting at the corner of his mouth facing sideways, and I'm gonna push in and rotate down. Now this doesn't have to be, meet his teeth, but a lot of times it does, all right? So this is a good fit for him. It's just helping to displace that tongue. And now I can come in and ventilate with the BVM. So I'm again gonna make sure I've got the right size mask and bag and all that stuff. I'm gonna use my C&E method to get a good seal and I'm gonna ventilate. So see, we got good chest rise and fall. That's what we're looking for to make sure that the ventilation is adequate, okay? Now for the MPA, I'm going to come and I'm going to measure this from the tip of his nose down to his earlobe to make sure this is a good size for him. Now, he cannot have any type of head or facial trauma or active facial bleeding or anything like that concerns for me as far as using this, but he can still have a gag reflex or be semi-conscious when I'm using this, okay? So I've measured and I've got the appropriate size for him. Now I'm going to lubricate this up before I get ready to put it in. And now when I'm getting ready to put it in, if I go into the right nostril, I'm gonna start with the bevel facing the septum always. All right, this beveled end, that means it's cut off kind of at a slant. I'm gonna start with that beveled end facing the septum every time. But if I'm going into the right nostril, then all I need to do is just advance this slowly and it's already going with the curve of the face. All right, if I meet any resistance, I wanna kind of back off and just try to slow it down. It might need be that I need more lubrication or it might be a too big of a size. I don't wanna force it. If this is where it stops for him, I can work with that. It doesn't have to be flush with the nostril, okay? Now, if I was going into the left side, I'm gonna start with the bevel facing the septum, but as I meet resistance, I'm gonna turn it so that it winds up going in with the curve of the face, okay? Now, you can put two of these in. You can put one in each nostril. You can put an OPA and an MPA. You can put two MPAs and OPAs. It's a little bit overkill in my opinion, but there are plenty of people that do that kind of thing, okay? So whatever you feel like it's gonna take for this patient, all right? So that's the OPA and the MPA. Same thing, I could continue to ventilate right over this, all right? Now, for our end title, we talked about using end title uh, in a lot of different ways, and one of those ways is gonna be tube confirmation tomorrow when we talk about advanced airway. But we can also utilize this in between just the mask and the BVM, okay? So if I put these together like this, and I'm ventilating, and I hook this up to my cardiac monitor, it's gonna give me some feedback. It might not be 100% accurate if he's not breathing on his own, but it's gonna give me something. All right, so that I have a baseline and that way I can continue to monitor, is he getting worse or is he getting better, all right? What I can also do with this in place is use the rescue pod, and we're gonna talk more about rescue pod when we talk about cardiac arrest management, but the rescue pod is gonna be for patients specifically in cardiac arrest. I think they mentioned it briefly in our CPR video, but this is an impedance threshold device which is gonna help build up the pressure in the chest, all right? 
That's not a, like an airway skill. I just wanted you to see how those can still stack together so that when we get to cardiac arrest, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? So we can utilize all of these devices together to most benefit the patient. All right, if I wanna take this out, I just need to pull it out with the curve of the face. If I wanna take the OPA out, I'm just gonna pull it straight out and down. Hopefully not twist or do anything to aggravate his gag reflex, okay? All right, so I'm gonna show you the suction stuff really quick. All right, so we talked about that this morning with the, um, uh, the portable and the wall mount suction. These are gonna be our best options here. Now this one does not have the piece that is connecting the top of this over to the machine itself, but ideally you would, okay? And so then when I cut this machine on, if it was charged up, I would want it to go up to 300 millimeters of mercury, all right? And so what, how I know it's suctioning is that when I take this out and this rigid piece, which is a yonker, if I cover this hole right here, that's when it starts suctioning, okay? So if I just put this up against my hand like this and I cover the hole, because it's not gonna do anything until you cover the hole, I should feel it kind of suctioning to know that it's working, all right? And 300 millimeters of mercury is at least where you wanna be, okay? So I've got all of this stuff set up here and I have my sterile water on hand as well. And so what I'm gonna do to suction this patient's mouth is I want to come in, I'm gonna measure from the corner of his earlobe to the corner of his mouth of how far I wanna go in. And then I'm just gonna mark that with my finger just like this, okay? So I know I'm not going further than that, I'm not causing any damage, I'm not stimulating a gag reflex when I do this right here, okay? So now I can use my cross finger technique, I'm gonna come back in. Now, I'm not going to apply suction on the way in. Okay, only on the way out. So I'm not covering the hole, I'm putting this in. Now I'm covering the hole and I'm going to withdraw, so I'm pulling out at the same time that I'm doing circular motions, okay? And I'm doing this for no longer than five seconds for infants, 10 seconds for pediatric, 15 seconds for adults, okay? If this was really thick vomit that I could not suction up with this, I'm gonna turn him on his side and help sweep some of that out. If it's continuous vomit or bleeding where he needs continuous suctioning, I need to turn him over on his side and let some of that run out because I can't suction continuously. I need to suction for 15 seconds and then ideally oxygenate for about two minutes before I suction again, okay? So that's for the rigid. Now we also have the option to do the soft suction catheter and this is also called a French catheter. And so we could take this right out of its package and it hooks up, so I pop this right off from the tubing, and this piece will go right back on. It also has this hole that needs to be covered to apply suction, okay? Now this one has this sleeve on it just to be sterile. I don't have to take off all the plastic. It has a piece that I can rip off at the end. Not all of them are like that, but just to give you an idea, okay? And you can just push back or pull back the plastic however far you need to. Now depending on what you're gonna do with this is gonna depend on how deep it needs to go. Okay, if I was going to be suctioning my patient's nose, then I want to go from the corner of the earlobe to the tip of the nose, and I don't want to go any deeper than that. So if they had like a lot of bleeding or a lot of secretions coming out of the nose, just copious amounts that needs to be suctioned out so it's not running back down the throat, then I would come in. Again, I've applied my suction on the way out, so I would insert this much. You can lubricate it if you need to, but usually if it's already bleeding, you don't need a lot of lubrication. Then I would apply my suction, try to do some circular motions, and withdraw, okay? You can also use this for infant's mouths, and we can use it on our advanced airway tubes, which I'll show you tomorrow, okay? Once I'm done with this, what either way, whether it's a soft suction or the rigid suction, as soon as I'm done suctioning, I wanna come in and suction up some of this sterile water to clear the line. All right, and so all of my blood vomit secretion should be contained in this canister. If you got a lot, it might fill this up and we might need to change the canister out. If we do, we would change out this whole thing, leave the lid on it and everything, put it in a biohazard bag and get a clean canister. They do make bigger canisters than this. This is a pretty uh, small size for the portable, but they do have bigger ones that are usually for the wall mount, okay? So that's gonna be it for suctioning. And then the last thing that we need to look at is going to be CPAP. All right.